Well, I'm going to share some things with you that I think will help you. Now, I grew up in a time where this was, it'll date me a little bit, but it was back in the, the, er, the late 60s and the early 70s when there was a big emphasis on, oh, let me say it this way, it was a big emphasis on outward appearance. In fact, we'd try to clean people up before they ever got to Jesus. We'd try to get them to look right, act right, wear the right clothes, behave the right way. And it reminded me a lot of, I was thinking back about the scripture, Moses and, you know, the, the Pentateuch, the Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. He spent a lot of time talking about the don'ts. Don't do this, don't do that. Okay, so that was kind of like my, we had a list of things not to do. We were very, what I like to call religious. We thought that by not doing all of these things that it positioned us in a better position with God. And then we discovered later in the, actually it was in 1968, the charismatic renewal or revival, some people call it, started in 1968 and began to sweep the nation. It was the change of our life. Now, we didn't discover it until 1972 or 73. We were in Chicago, and it was kind of cool how God did that because my dad was the pastor of a little church up there and had become very kind of frustrated with the ministry at that time because... We were in one of those churches. My dad always had a, an evangelistic heart to see people come to Jesus, which I have that same heart. My passion is to see people connected to Jesus. I don't get, don't comprehend, can't understand, and probably uh, come too close to judging people who just want to have us for and no more. And so we pastored, my dad pastored the church. I say we because I was all involved even as a kid. And so we had a church that just was us four and no more. We had a little girl in our church, this little girl. Her name was Terry. And Terry was sled riding in Chicago and slid right out into a car, got hit by a car, and was in a coma for months, for months. And my dad, I remember this like it was yesterday. My dad he would go to the hospital and visit Terry. He would pray for Terry. He would just uh, pray for her, pray for her, pray for her. She was in a coma. The, the doctors said, we don't know if she'll ever come out of the coma. And my dad had been taught by his particular Bible college that the gifts of the Holy Spirit weren't for today, that those had passed away. We were very religious in our behavior, man. We had the, you know, the women didn't wear, didn't wear pants and the, the men had to keep their hair cut real short and all the, the rules. But my dad was like, look, I need Jesus. And, it, and he prayed this prayer. Lord, if you still heal today, I need you to let me know. I don't see it in the word that you ever stopped working miracles and performing miracles. I don't see that in the word. And so this particular day, he went to the hospital and he walked in Terry's room and he was kind of shy about it a little bit. So he walked up to Terry's feet and he just kind of put his hands on her feet and he said, Lord, I just do what you did in your word. I lay hands on her right now and I speak that she is healed. And I don't know if you still do this or not, but I sure like to know. And he laid hands on her and he began to, he finished and she didn't change condition at that second, but he walked over to this side of the room at, near this side of the bed. And he said that he goes, I swear I see her eyes follow me. And so he went to the other side slowly went to the other side of the bed and her eyes seemed to follow him and he goes, am I seeing this? He went back to the other side, her eyes followed again. He goes out to the nurse at the nurse's station and says, 
can I ask you a question? She says, absolutely, sure, ask me a question. Terry, is it my imagination that her eyes are following me across the room? And she said, yes, it is your imagination. That, she's not doing that. That's your imagination. He said, man, it seems like it. He went back in the room and he did it again. He was looking very intently in Terry's <laughs> eyes and they were following him. He went back out to the nurse's station. He said, you, no, you need to come in here. The nurse said, no, I am telling you, it is your imagination. And my dad said, please, come in here with me. And he got the nurse to come in, and he showed the nurse. And the nurse said, oh, oh. <laughs> she, ran, she ran out of the room, and my dad said, what was that about? And about just about within three minutes, there were like 25 people in the room. And the nurse was going, look, look what she's doing. She's coming out. She's coming out. She's coming out of it. She's coming out of it. Well, here's the cool thing. And this changed. The, the reason we are here together is because of that particular day. And it was just about three weeks later, everybody. And I remember the church. I could picture it had double doors in the back. And she came in a little bit late, but that we had started church and walking up that aisle was Terry. And she walked up the aisle, sat on the front row. And if you knew, if you remember, some of you remember my dad, my dad is, a, I cry, but my dad, he cried at a whole nother level. And so that service was wrecked. In a good way, everybody. Terry was healed, and she, uh, it wasn't one of those healings where she walked out of the room that day, but it was only two or three weeks later, and she walked in the church. And, and, and so my dad began to say, okay, God, if you did that, what about this? What about that? And we began to watch the miraculous power of God. And let me tell you where it all stemmed from. Thoughts. Sometimes you have thoughts that need to be challenged because maybe you've developed a pattern of old thinking. We've been talking about, you know, pulling down those strongholds, which are strong pylons that have been driven into the ground of our thought processes. Romans chapter 12 says, don't conform to the ways or some translations say to the patterns of the world. What is he talking about the world? You know, uh, 1 John chapter 2 says, do not love the world or anything that is in the world, which always confused me because I thought God loved the world. It says it in John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Well, those are two different references of the world. I want to explain it to you because this, if you'll get this, this will help your Christian walk. And I am not talking about getting you to become more religious and look good and great on the outside, although you already do. Look at you. Just look at you. You guys look fabulous. But that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about your heart, getting your heart to a position and to a place where you are ablaze, where you are on fire for God, and you're not weird. You know what I'm saying? I'm saying where you're able to touch your world around you, where you're able to influence people around you without being judgmental, religious, holier than thou, self-righteous, that you are humble, 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 humble. Humble. It's one of the greatest character traits you can have is to remain humble. Just being a humble person that even when you're right and you know you're right, you still have a posture of humility. Yeah. Isn't that a good trait to have? Yeah. You know, that's just, let me just, if you don't know that's a good trait, everybody, that's a good trait to have. We always talk about at the end when we speak the blessing, 
you are a people magnet for this purpose. God has given you a ministry, a ministry of reconciliation to bring people to Jesus, to bring people to Jesus, to bring people to Jesus. And that ministry of reconciliation comes because you're an ambassador here in this world and you have a magnetic, winsome, attractive personality and spirit that people are going to eventually, First Peter says this, they're going to come to you and say, what is the reason you have this hope? What is it about you that's different than you used to be? Or even if they're meeting you for the first time, there's something special about you. You're not like everybody else. You've got something special. What is that? And you need to be able to say more than, hey, I'm just cool. <laughs> you are cool, but there's more to it than your cool factor. So I want to just teach you for just a second about our thinking because we all have two mindsets. We have the mindset of the flesh, which Romans chapter 8, verse 7 says, it is impossible. It's not even like, well, I can... No, it says the mind of our flesh cannot please God. In fact, it's impossible for the mind of your flesh to please God. It's the, the scripture goes on in Romans chapter 8, verse 7, and it says, it, your mind, the mind of your flesh is hostile to God. The ways of God, the hostility of my flesh is hostile to God's thinking and God's ways. But here's what happened. When you get born again, the anointing is in Christ is how you're born again. The phrase Paul used all the way through the whole New Testament is in Christ, in Christ, in Christ, in Christ, in Christ. In Christ. So what does that mean? Christ, the word Christ means the anointing and the anointed one. And here's what happens. When you are born again, he paid for all of the sins that you've ever committed on the cross. You don't come to him because you're a good person and because you've been good. You come to him by the grace gift of God's gift to you. You're born again. And the scripture says in Romans that you've been imputed righteousness from God. It's God's gift to you. You're right with God and in right standing with him, not based on, well, I did good three days, so he likes me today. But out of the revelation, out of the rhema, the rhema means the understood word of God, not the, just the ink on the page, but what God wants to do is to take that word and Hebrews says it's alive. The word is powerful, it's active, it's sharper than anything. It goes down into your soul, your mind, your emotions, your willpower, and it transforms you. That's what the rest of Romans chapter 12 says is, don't do it by the pattern that the rest of the world does it and the way everybody else does it. No, instead, be changed, be transformed, become the person that you really are created to be, that your spirit knows. Who you are is hidden, it's a secret, it's hidden in the anointing. Yeah. It's in the anointing. Where? In Christ. Your relationship with Christ is why you and I have to study the word, hear the word like we're hearing it right now, and move forward in this walk called the walk of faith. Realizing who you are, understanding who you are. You are a special person. We've talked about you guys are not normal. You are so not normal. You are a peculiar bunch of people. Mm -hmm. And you're holy. What does it mean to be holy? It's the same word as the word death. Death just means separation. Nobody will ever cease to exist, everybody. You won't cease to exist when you die. You'll just be separated from your physical body. Spiritual death is separation from, from God. God exists. You exist. You are a spirit. You don't have a spirit. That's who you are. You are a spirit. Spiritual death is separation. But when you're born again, because of what Christ Jesus did at the cross, now there's communion, common union, fellowship. You have the ability to approach the throne room. There's no separation other than your own, the mind of your flesh, other than, watch this, this, this is why the enemy lies to you, to put the shame and the guilt on you so that you separate from Christ. 
not, not God being like, you know, I, my dad would do this in church when he would preach and I was in the back and I was messing up, you know, like talking to my friends and stuff. All he did was he'd do this. He'd do a pants adjustment. Because, you know, you could get by with that face in the back in those days because the preaching was like, you're going to hell. All dad had to do is just look at me and go. That meant when I got home, I know this is politically incorrect, but when I got home, that belt was coming off. Did anybody, are any of you old enough to remember those days? Me too. I'll tell you how it was back in my day was, I remember getting spankings at my friend's house. <laughs> That's just wrong. <laughs> anyway, here's what shame and guilt does, and this is why you have to have a righteousness conscious. You have to be aware and conscious up in your head of how righteous God has made you and the new you. So how do I find out this hidden person? Was well, by spending time with God and growing with God because you are a new creation, altogether made new. Colossians says this. This is the scripture we read last week. Colossians says, you've been made new. In fact, I want to read that to you because I don't want you to miss this. It says, you have been made new in the anointing. You have been raised with Christ to a new life. The Amplified Bible says it this way, thus sharing in his resurrection from the dead. Aim at, seek at the eternal treasures, which are above, where Christ is seated, the anointing, and seated at the right hand of God. And then verse two says, set your mind and keep your mind set on the things that are above, the, not on things of the earth. Keep them set on things above. That's why Jesus comes along teaching in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the kingdom, the kingdom, the kingdom, the kingdom, the kingdom, the kingdom, the kingdom of heaven. Pray this way. Let it be done on earth as it is in heaven. And then he goes on and explains over and over, the kingdom of God is like this. The kingdom of God is like that. The kingdom of God is like this. The kingdom of God is like this. And then he says, set your mind, and that's the same exact Greek word that we use to set a broken bone. Set it, put a cast on it, it's out of alignment, get it realigned. Your mind, not just yours, but yours, 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 mine. All of us, the flesh of our mind, we have a broken mind. It's like a broken bone, it's broke. Your thinking is skewed. Mine too, the flesh. That's why he goes on and says, for as this world is concerned, you're dead. Your new real life, the Amplified says, is hidden in the anointing. So who you really are, you don't even know. You don't even know the real you. Oh, you don't even know. Who you really are is found and revealed in the anointing, in the anointing of Christ. Okay, so when the scripture talks about here in 1 John chapter 2, he says, the word of God is always abiding in your heart. And you've been victorious over the wicked one. Don't love, watch this part, don't love or cherish the things that are in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that's in the world, the lust of the flesh, the gratification of the sensual nature, the lust of the eye, the greed, longing and craving in your mind for the things in the world, and then the pride of life, the assurance of one's own resources and own ability in earthly things. He says, these things don't come from the Father, but from the world itself. And the world will pass away and disappear with it, will pass away the forbidden cravings, the passionate desires, the lust of it, but he who does the will of God carries out his, God's purpose in his life, that person who's obeying God, and will um, uh, uh, remain and abide forever. So here's what I want you to know. 
Let me read one more verse, verse 27. But as for you, the anointing that you received from him abides permanently in you so that you have no need that anyone instruct you. It doesn't mean you, you don't need teaching like this. What it means is um, you've got the Holy One on the inside of you. If you're feeding on the word and that word's going on on the inside of you and you're humble submitting to that word, you're gonna be all right. You're not going anywhere. He said, in him, there is no falsehood. So you must abide and never depart from being rooted and knit together with him just as his anointing has taught you to do. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, 1 Corinthians chapter 3, both of those chapters talk about the body that we live in being the temple of the Holy Spirit. When Jesus, you know, uh, went to the cross, he paid for your sins and mine. And why did he do that? so that he could send the Holy Spirit. Man, I wish I had a couple more hours to teach you, but I won't keep you that long. But watch, you remember the temple, the Moses' temple? And he had the outer court, the inner court, and then the Holy of Holies. Well, your body became that replica. A lot of people don't know this. Scripture says in the book of Hebrews that the Old Testament is a type and a shadow for things to be revealed. God works in mysteries. You're hidden in the anointing. God works in secrets. God works in patterns and ways, okay? So when you go and you study the Old Testament, you find the New Testament. In the Old Testament, the New Testament is revealed and the other way around. When you study the New Testament, you begin to have sense made of, of these Old Testament ways. Right. Now watch this. Romans chapter 12 says, don't think the way the world thinks. Don't pattern your thinking after the world the way everybody else does it. Instead, be transformed. But he says, how do you do it? Present your bodies as living sacrifices. Remember, you get on the altar and you say, God, what do you want me to do? Here's my life. And a lot of times, this is where we're probably going to go ouch a little bit, ouch a little bit. A lot of times what we do is we want what we want in our head, but the Lord wants what he wants in you becoming. So watch this. I'm going to get on the altar again. We did it last week, but it's so fun to do. <laughs> Present your body as a living sacrifice. I'm alive, but it's my body. And this is flesh and bone. It's, a, it's like the old temple. There's three parts to me. There's my spirit, my soul, and then my body. What God wants is my body to be presented to him. Now, what we used to think was, like that scripture, uh, you don't love the world. We, we, we thought that it meant that if you had anything, that you must not be, you know, like if you had money and you had wealth and you had things that you were probably not a real good Christian. That's really, and did you know a lot of people think that today? They think that having, being in poverty is very godly. Yeah. How can you be a blessing? Here, let, let's, let's go down that rabbit trail just one second. So in the old school church, we thought you had to be poor to be spiritual. And we needed a new roof on the church. And we wanted to raise money to build a new, a new, a new church building for the congregation. We wanted to support missionaries. But the problem was, well, you're supposed to be godly and be poor. <laughs> so to fix a broken roof took 45 years. That's not what he's talking about when he says that. He's talking about the lust of the world, that you just use this world. You're supposed to occupy. Jesus sent his father, sent the son Jesus, because on this globe, the authority of this globe has been given to mankind. We think that, Demons are so powerful, but they were only as powerful 
as the ear that people are willing to listen to their lies. And guess who listens to them more than probably anybody? Mm -hmm, you're right, Christians. That's why when you see Christians get so funky and so deceived and you go, oh my goodness, how could they behave that way? That's just the weirdest thing. I thought they were more mature than that. Well, the enemy whispers offense. What does the enemy whisper? Doubt. Did God say, get you to question? The enemy will always make accusations. He's the accuser of the brother. This is a good stuff, isn't it? Tonight, this is good stuff because... What the Lord wants from us is to push back from offense. We're, we're unoffendable. We forgive. We love. Yeah, not that offense won't come, but what you do with it matters. So present your body. So you say, okay, I'm going to present my body. That means my time, my energy, my smile my resources, my talent, my passions. So we think of it in more of a religious way, like, okay, God, I'm climbing up on the altar. I'll present it to you. <laughs> but then, watch, then. Wait a minute. They just made a call. They need nursery workers and children's church workers. I probably should do that. I'm presenting my body. It's only once a month or sometimes twice a month. Oh. But I'd have to miss a service or two. I wouldn't want to miss praise and worship and I wouldn't want to miss the word. I'm a consumer. Oh, I, I, you don't hear any amens up in this house right now, do you? <laughs> but I'm on the altar. Am I too much in your business? You guys are all acting like, oh, dear God, he knows. He knows. You're right, I know. I know, the, I know the way it works. The funnest place to be is right here in the chair. Yeah. Wait a minute, though. I'm on the altar. I want to be there, though. But the altar says... It requires some of my time. Yeah. It requires some of my talent. Yes. It requires some of my passion. Yes. People ask me from time to time, what are the greatest needs in this church? Right now at this window of time, the two greatest needs we have, I'll go ahead and give you three. The first one is, uh, is a number one on the list is children's ministry workers. Nursery, yes. children's ministries, you guys work in there, you know what I'm talking about. We need more. And I can promise you this, the blessing that will come from being a sacrifice on the altar. People, I'm just going to go ahead and go there because it's just us family. There's nobody here but us, right? Right. And all of you online and on YouTube. <laughs> the, our kids are important. We don't just babysit. There's some rumor going around that we don't have curriculum. Somebody is lying about it. We've got some of the most awesome curriculum uh, that we have. It's incredible. So stuff like that that you hear, well, they don't have curriculum. Somebody's just lying. We have incredible curriculum. Yeah. And uh, in fact, Joel will, he'll show you the curriculum. It's awesome. But why do we have curriculum? Because we don't just babysit our children. We impart to them. We're passing the baton. Those are our future leaders. By the time they hit 11, 12, 13 years old, they're operating cameras. They're helping yeah. greet. They're helping in the coffee shop, in the bookstore. But it all starts back with the children's ministry. Yeah. You, mean, you mean you want me to miss a service to do that? No, you're not missing a service. You're not missing. Thank you, Ollie. Ollie yes. is one of the most incredible children's church workers. Ollie, they don't miss a service, do they? No, you get back what you give. 
See, here's what happens. The flesh, the mind of the flesh, see, because maybe we hadn't thought of it this way. The mind of the flesh says this, instant gratification. I want what I want, and I want what I want, when I want it, and when I want it is right now. But the spirit and the mind of the spirit, which, by the way, Scripture says about you, the mind of Christ is in you. You have the mind of Christ. But the mind of Christ, it ain't up here. It's in your spirit. And so watch. So when you give, when you serve with your time, your talent, your resources, it's called a sacrifice for a reason. My flesh wants to do that. But it's a sacrifice. I know. It's a sacrifice. But when you do, you bless everybody else. You're for sure blessing our children. I watch our children's church workers. I watch you serve. I go by and I I see. And I thank God for you. So the number one need is children's. The number two need in the church right now is technicians and media, cameras, audio, lighting. At both campuses, the needs are the same. And then the third one, you may think that we don't need leaders. Well, you've got enough leaders. No, we need people that will step up into leadership that are mature spiritually, that have a humble heart. They're humble and they have a mindset of love for other people like this message of love and the little cards that we have at at, at the the desk outside. Pass one of those cards. That's the culture of Enjoy Church unconditional love for people. You don't have to become anything to come and sit in here and for us yes. to love on you. Yes. And you don't have it all, have to have it all together to start volunteering and serving. You can be still messed up like the rest of us. <laughs> people think we've got it all together. No, we don't. We're growing though. We're growing. We're getting it right. We're adjustable. Let the word transform us into the people that you say that we can be. Let me just give you something since we're talking about the body. This is amazing. I'll just give you a nugget of it before we close. Your body is a pattern of the temple. Let me explain. You have 12 ribs on one side and 12 ribs on the other side that protect what? The vital organs, the heart. These 12 ribs represent... In the Old Testament, they represent the 12 tribes. These 12 ribs represent the 12 apostles. The teaching that comes from the Old Testament and the teaching that comes from the New Testament protect the heart, which in the heart, the belly and the heart, that represents, this is all metaphorical and and a pattern and a type of the temple where 1 Corinthians chapter 3, 1 Corinthians chapter 6 says, now the Holy Spirit lives and resides on the inside of you. The vitals, the breath of the Holy Spirit. If you go back to Genesis chapter 1, Genesis chapter 2, the spirit, the pneuma, of the Old Testament, the Hebrew called it the rock. <laughs> the rock. That's the breath of God. When he created Adam, he ruach, breathed in the temple when once a year when the Holy Spirit would come and sit between them on the mercy seat between those cherub angels' wings. The Bible tells us this and the Jewish history records that the breath of God in that temple would breathe in and out and the temple curtains would go... And it was a heavy breathing sound. It wasn't the sound of a human breathing. It was God breathing. And then you come to the New Testament, Acts chapter 2. There was a sound of a mighty rushing wind. What was that? That was the breath of God. Now it's the Greek word pneuma, the breath of God. This is why you need to be baptized in the Holy Spirit. It's not, a, I mean, a, yeah, you can go to heaven with, but let me just tell you, you get the Holy Spirit when you receive Jesus. There's a, there's a baptism of salvation when you say yes to him. 
But then there's the baptism of water, and then there's the baptism of his spirit. And when you say yes to him, and every believer has the ability to be baptized in the Holy Spirit, you need to be because that's the pneuma, the breath of God on the inside of you. So watch this. The two, you've been given two lungs, one lung. This is just more metaphors of the Old Testament and the New Testament. One lung represents the Old Testament. One lung represents the New Testament. Yeah, you can breathe with that one. But somebody ever says the Old Testament's not relevant anymore? They wrong. How many of you want to give up one of your lungs? No, you want the breath flowing through both of those babies. Now, you could live off of one or the other. But why? If you've got both, right? We could go on, and I won't do it for time's sake, but we could go on and look at the post in the temple, the post to the entrance. The post in the temple represent your skeleton structure. Those posts were covered with drapes, which were made from skin. You wear skin on your post that allows you to stand up. You have 33 vertebrae in your back. 24 of those vertebrae is what they say allows you to have posture and to stand up. You have five of your vertebrae that are fused together. They represent, metaphorically, represent the apostle, the pastor, the teacher, the evangelist, the prophet. They're fused together. You have four vertebrae that represent, I believe it's the sacrum. They represent Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Now, are those some, what is that? What is all that that I said? It's just a type and a shadow and a pattern of what? Of a revelation all the way back in the Old Testament about, see, this is why, Hebrews says that all of these people had faith, but they died. Hebrews 11, they all had faith, but they died not having received the promise. Well, we always thought that meant that they didn't get their miracle. No, no, no. They got what they were believing for, but what was the promise? The promise they were believing for was Jesus, the Messiah. And he said in Hebrews chapter 11, you today, Christ has arrived. He's paid the price. You have received the promise and all of the promises are wrapped up in the promise, Jesus. And now you got him. And there's a whole new life waiting for you and me to live. We just need to have our mind transformed and get the understanding and the revelation what it's like to have the Holy One living on the inside of us, that the Holy Spirit is living on us, on the inside of us. God still works miracles. God wants to do miracles through you. My job is to equip you to do the ministry. People think that the pastor, it's the pastor's job to, to do all the stuff. No, my job is to teach you the understanding of God's word, the revelation of it, and to get you to understand who you are. And, and that's why Earl goes to the prisons, goes to the, to, to the police departments and visit the prisoners. And every week, I love it. Every week he comes to me and says, I visited this many people this week and I prayed with this many people and these many people accepted Christ and these people told me to get out. That's the other side of it, right? He said, that guy did not want to see me. No, get out. But most of them, most of them are open. They want prayer. See, the people you work with, the neighbors you have, the life you have, the children you have, hey, there's a ministry on the inside of you. There's secrets on the inside of you. Somebody needs to sign up. Is there a way to sign up for the children's ministry, Joel? At the front? Is there a paper out there? There's a paper. Sign up for children's. We're talking. Come on. Once a month, twice a month. Do it. Do it, do it, do it, do it, do it, do it. (laughs) It'll change your life, and it will for sure change their life. And someday... You may not even know right here, right now, but someday when you get to heaven, some person's going to come up and say, I know you don't probably remember me, but you were my teacher at church 
and you'd turn the curriculum on and we would study and you thought I wasn't paying attention most of the time I wasn't but boy that one time you said something you prayed for me you forgave me when I wasn't acting quite right come on church let's be the church I know I'm just hitting on the children in the media same with the media if you've got a passion for that that's a great place some of you are very mature you've got leadership on the inside of you and what that looks like is just getting more involved getting more involved you sure can that's just one of those nights (laughs) so I just found out for both campuses. I had no idea. That's crazy, and I couldn't do that, but I'm willing to do, I do one Saturday a month. I feel like that's a big sacrifice because I have my son Wade, and, but I'm willing to do one more Saturday night if two or three people walk up right now just to do one night. That's, that's leadership right there. It's like, I'll set the example. I'll do that. See, this... This is what church is. This is what church is really all about. We, that's just Saturday night. We're talking about, we got a bunch of services going on. Thank you guys. Thank you. And, and tonight was just a catalyst of, you might think, well, boy, he went way out of his way to recruit children's church workers. Actually, that wasn't even on the agenda. It's not in my notes. But the Holy Spirit out of your belly sometimes will just lead you in places you go, oh, where are we going, Lord? And I believe that's what, you know, we, I did that last night, but that, didn't, that wasn't the results last night at O'Fallon. But it will be. It will be. We have an incredible, incredible opportunity before us, church, to do the most incredible things for our community and to this world. And how many of you know God wants to be able to trust us? I mean, put yourself, I know this is weird, but put yourself in God's position for just a second. What if God said, I wanna send 3,000 people just like in the next six months? to enjoy church, could you enjoy church handle the weight, the weightiness of 3,000 people? Here's what we would need. We'd need more workers than we have, more volunteers. We'd need more leaders who are stepping up to say, I'll lead that pastor. I'll lead that. I'll start that outreach. I'll start that ministry. And, And that's what we would need. And if we get positioned, that's why we have this house project. We're fixing the structures of both campuses. You sense the spiritual atmosphere changing. Just the, I mean, it started the week we started that. And if we get the the structure of leadership and ministries all in place and volunteers ready to serve wherever and whenever, let me just tell you, then just watch those doors open up and you'll see faces. Where, where are they coming from? Who's inviting them? Well, just like those evil spirits seek bodies because the devil has no power unless he has somebody to act on those thoughts. Get offended. Say this. Do that. People don't even know they're being used to the devil. But you can tell by the fruit. But just like that, on the other side of it, the Holy Spirit on the inside of you and the angels that God wants to dispatch to minister to people, those angels can do the same thing. They can influence you and other people in a positive way to be open to the voice of God. And all of a sudden, now that we've got our structure in place and we've got something that'll hold the weight of the outpouring of God, well, then God's gonna pour, pour out. So sometimes it's just us going, okay, God, I'm positioned. I know I can't make you do this, but I just want you to know I'm here to do what you want me to do. 
Father, in the name of Jesus, we just come before you. And, and uh, Lord, we thank you for nights like this where your spirit shows up. We thank you in the name of Jesus that you're going to use us. We're available and we're obedient. We are living sacrifices. I know it's a sacrifice for us at times, but it's never in this kingdom. It, our mindset, our spiritual mindset is one of seed, of time, and of harvest, not instant gratification, but we are willing to sow a seed to reap a harvest down the road. And that's our mindset. That's the way we think. We think that way. We're sowing a seed to reap a harvest. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, we're going to do that with...